Thank you so much for coming to this session using the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, to advance social emotional learning at the local level. My name is Bob LaRocca. I'm Director of Policy and Communications at an organization called Transforming Education. And before I get into our agenda and our discussion, I just want to give you a one slide brief overview of the work that our organization does. And I just want to say I'm delighted and thrilled to be here today. I'm from Boston, and that's where Transform Ed is based. And what we do as an organization is we work to support the development and the assessment of social emotional skills for kids. Okay? We do this by bridging the world of education, research, psychology, and neuroscience with the world of education policy and practice. And so one way that we do this is we are a strategic advisor to different school systems and to different states. So for example, we were an advisor to the core districts in California. Okay, how many of you have heard of the core districts in California? Okay, cool, a few of you. We helped them to roll out their unique data measurement index that incorporated the use of social emotional competencies. And I'll talk a lot more about that in a second. We also partner with leading scientists and researchers from across the country to take their findings and help translate it into actionable policies and practices for teachers and schools. So we partner with uh, folks at the Center for Education Policy Research at Harvard. We're a uh, partner with a guy named Mark, uh, professor named Mark Brackett from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. All of these folks are doing great work in the field of social emotional learning research and we are, we are working with them and we're, we're very much excited to do that. And so here's our agenda. So the first thing I want to do is just quickly go over what is social emotional learning. If you are here, you are curious about it. Maybe you have, do a lot of work with it. Maybe you just it's something that you've heard of that's come up in the last few years and you want to know more. So we're going to talk about what that is and help work to define it. I'm then going to lay out the case for measuring social emotional learning, okay? Which is a very, very new thing that our organization, um, we do, and we're seeing it pop up throughout the country. I'm then going to talk very briefly about ESSA. It's a huge law, right? I'm just going to talk a little bit about how it fits with social emotional learning. I'm then going to provide an example of SEL measurement in practice in terms of a formative assessment. And then I usually get a lot of questions about like this world of measuring students' SEL competencies. What's the research behind this? So I definitely want to save time at the end to have questions that you might have. And if something else pops up, I'm going to give you my information. You can absolutely contact me um, after the session, and we can, I will get back to you. OK, so first off, what is SEL? Um, just I, some, You were kind of spread out a little bit, and that's fine. But I, just, I want to know, uh, turn to the person next to you and ask that person, how do you define social emo emotional learning? And I would say, it is totally OK if the person says, I don't really know. OK, that's OK. We're going to work to pull that apart. So let's just do that very quickly. I'll give you like 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and then we'll come back and we will talk about it. OK, anybody want to offer up? How do you define social emotional learning? What is it? Any ideas? Brave souls? Does it have to do with the skills that people need in order to get along socially and to be able to control their emotions and, and with other people? Absolutely, right? Well, a key element of social emotional learning is working to build those kinds of competencies, whether it's emotional intelligence or working with others, collaboration. Okay. Anybody else? Cool. Well, you actually took part of what I was going to say, which is great. We define social emotional learning as the building of intra and interpersonal competencies. What does that mean? All right? I like to talk about it in the same way you did, ma'am, in terms of the actual skills themselves. Okay? So some of the types of competencies that SEL tries to build are, and this is not an exhaustive list, it's just four, self-management, so the ability to regulate your actions or your beliefs. Growth mindset, okay, this has become really big in the last couple of years, this idea that you can improve your ability over time, okay, through effort, through different practices. Social awareness, the ability to empathize with others, the ability to take different perspectives. This is often fits into the vein of emotional intelligence too, similar, right? Self-efficacy, so the ability that you can succeed in reaching a particular goal. And when we talk about this in the context of education, we're talking about an academic goal. Okay. So that's what SEL is. 
How you, what you may have found, if you turn to the person next to you, okay, is that this field is a lot like a Tower of Babel, right? All right, there's a lot of different terms used to describe very, very similar contexts. And sometimes it gets very researchy, and I'm not a researcher. Um, but I want to make one quick note here. There's, uh, we refer to a specific subset of these SEL competencies as mindsets, essential skills, and habits. Okay? And the reason why we do that is because there are some of these competencies that are shown through research to matter to student outcomes that are in some way measurable and in some way uh, malleable or teachable. We call it the three M's. So if competencies meet those three M's, we like to call them mindsets, essential skills, and habits. So it's, it's both interpersonal and intrapersonal. Don't worry if you're a little confused. I'm not going to use the term mesh in this presentation. It's how we talk about it on our website and how we actually talk about it in some of our papers and the work we do. I'm just going to refer to them as social emotional competencies for the purpose of this. But, but just putting this up here, it, 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 it is entirely understandable if in the world of social emotional learning you're hearing a lot of different terms. It's really because the field hasn't yet come to a consensus about what is the best term to describe them. And that's okay. Okay, so I want to lay out the case for measuring social emotional learning. Okay, and it starts with a very basic fact. Research shows that SEL matters, not terribly shocking, right? If you're a teacher, if you're an educator, if you're a parent, if you're just somebody connected to the world, I don't think it is that, like you're going too far out on a limb that you were told, like, you know, research says that if you have some of these competencies, you're more likely to be successful academically, you're more likely to have career success, and you're more likely to have healthy or, or, or greater well-being. However, the reason why I bring this up is because we see research bear this out consistently. Okay, it's not just like a one-off study that shows it. We see it repeatedly over time. I'm not going to go into each one of these bullet points, but as I just said, students with strong social-emotional competencies tend to have greater academic achievement levels. Okay, so get better, stronger scores on math and English. More likely to, uh, to be employed. And less likely to have negative health effects, such as obesity, smoking, substance abuse, and mental health disorders. There's a lot to this, okay? We do have a paper online on our, on our website at transformingeducation.org called Ready to be Counted. It summarizes all of this research. I don't have the time to go into all of it now, but I, I encourage you, if you're interested in the research behind why these competencies matter, go check out that paper. It's free. It's available to be downloaded. It's called Ready to be Counted. Beyond the research saying that SEL matters, though, what else do we know? We know from national survey data that almost 90% of educators say that their school is already implementing some kind of program, some kind of practice, some kind of thing to advance SEL in their students, okay, to build those skills in their students. This is just a quick snapshot of some of the programs that are out there. Obviously, there's a lot more. I tried to categorize them for you, although I will say some of these programs bleed into different categories. But there are discrete interventions like PERTS. It's a program out of Stanford that works to build growth mindset. It advocates for growth mindset in students. I'm sure many of you have heard of PBIS, which is uh, essentially setting, uh, setting certain explicit expectations for students' behavior and then reinforcing positive behavior. There's all kinds of teacher professional development, professional learning, teacher strategies. We have some toolkits on our website that relate to the competencies I mentioned that you can use but there's a lot of other programs out there. For example, the Greater Good Science Center in Berkeley. They do a lot of interesting work around mindfulness. They do a retreat for teachers over the summer. They put out a publication. And then there are more comprehensive programs that do a lot of these things. It combines them, and then there's also some curriculum thrown in. Okay? But the main point here is that through survey data, we know schools are using these things. We know teachers are using them. And even if it's not one of these specific programs, other data shows that teachers are, educators are somehow using SEL in their classroom. Whether it's even having a conversation with a kid at the end of a class because they notice some behavior that they want to try to work on. Okay? We also know, and this is a paper that we're going to be putting out later on this fall, that when you take both teacher time inside the classroom and outside the classroom, and you add it to the amount of money that we're spending on these kinds of programs, Okay, we get to a figure of about $30 billion a year nationally we're spending on related to SEL. And we got this information from doing also a separate survey of principals, of teachers, of other policymakers across the country. Okay? 
So why does this matter? Like, what's the point in this? It's because while there are many great programs out there, as I just showed on the previous slide, the field has yet to come to a consensus about which practices work the best, which combination of practices work the best for students, and then how best to allocate resources, right? So we're doing a lot of great work with SEL, we just don't always have the information to tell us whether it's working well or not. Now we might have informal information, you might work with your students and see, you know, after class I had this conversation or we're using this program and I, I think that there's a difference being made, but we're not systematically collecting that data. And that's really important because measuring SEL enables us all to make better decisions in serving the whole child. At least that's the belief of our organization, okay? It gives us a better understanding of where students are with these competencies. And that advances notions of continuous improvement, right? We can better understand which approaches are working. We can build on that. It advances notions of equity. We can better understand whether those practices are working well for all students. And if there's a way to kind of target resources in a more effective way to students that need them. And again, thirdly, going back to the research, it advances notions of student success, okay? If we focus on these competencies, we can support the growth of them and research shows us that that matters. So what I want to do is just show you a couple of examples of what SEL measurement looks like in practice. So a couple of you raised your hand when I said, what are the core districts? Well, core districts are a group of districts in California that have begun to measure these skills systematically. Okay? They're a group of eight districts. They serve a million students, over 1,600 schools. And CORE is actually, it's a nonprofit organization that fosters the collaboration among these districts and the sharing of best practices. And you can see here from this map, some of these districts are the biggest in California. They're, they're San Francisco, Sacramento, LA, Oakland. And what happened is this. In 2013, six superintendents from these districts got together and said, we want to actually find a way to create a new definition of school quality and student success. And we want to have it focus more on the whole child. We don't want schools and students to be constantly rated based on standardized tests academically alone. Okay, this is what they decided to do. And ultimately, they decided to use student self-reports, so surveys, okay, and teacher reports of students to collect some SEL data and factor that into their measurement index, which I should be clear in saying, what the purpose of this index was not to punitively punish schools, but to create capacity building and sharing of best practices. So CORE, what they did was they, they prioritized four different competencies, self-management, self-efficacy, social awareness, and growth mindset, the four that I put up on that original slide. And again, they decided to measure them. And they piloted some of these studies and they field tested it, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I want to give you an example first of, well, what are, we, like, what are you asking these kids? Like, how are you actually going to measure SEL? And this is just one example of, from our self-management scale of the kinds of questions we would ask student, I should, students. And I should say, um, all of these are free and available. We have, the, we have a set of curated measures on our website in a paper called Measuring Mesh. Okay, you can get it there. But this is just one example. So students were asked, during the past 30 days, how often did you come to class prepared? How often did you remember and follow directions? So on and so forth. I'll give you a second to read this. And then students could answer, well, almost never, once in a while, sometimes, often, or almost all the time. Now, I don't have a slide. I sometimes have it, but there's a lot I want to talk about. Um, you would think that students might not be totally forthright about this and say, all the time, they're great on all these things. And that's not actually what we found. We found tons of variability in their responses, which from like a researcher perspective, that's really good. Okay, you want to see variability because then otherwise the, the measure doesn't mean anything. But also we found that these self-reports were significantly predictive of these other student outcomes. What does that really mean? It means that these tests, these assessments, we're measuring what they were intended to measure. And they, were, they backed up what the research was saying. So this is the results from a field test that was conducted in 2015, okay? They were very encouraging. They showed that student scores correlated positively with academic achievement and negatively slightly, not, you can see it's not, not, not too strong, with other kinds of quote unquote negative behavioral outcomes like days suspended and total absences. In other words, Students that scored themselves higher, remember there were teacher reports of students here, but a lot of these, a bulk of this measurement was the students rating themselves, it's student voice, okay? 
Students, students that score themselves higher on these competencies tended to have higher academic scores. And there's more to this, but on a high level, you can see here if you break down each one of these bars relates to one of the competencies and how the students scored, okay? This established at least in the context of the core districts, not in accountability yet, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, that these were valid. These were valid measures, which is a big kind of breakthrough because you know, that's a big requirement as part of ESSA that you have measures that are valid. Another question about this is, well, now that you have measured these, these skills in students, what are you going to do with them? I just want to give you one example of what CORE is doing. Okay? They're using this data to help address issues of equity. Okay? They're constantly trying to approach this work that they're doing through a lens of equity so that they can break down data and try to see are there any gaps, are there any disparities among subgroups. Okay? In the course of all this work, they prioritized a few broad areas for improvement. One thing that emerged was that they wanted to work on improving math scores for African American and Latino students in uh, grades four through eight. And a key driver that surfaced from these conversations at a local level, so including teachers, including superintendents, was to try to incorporate more social emotional learning instruction into math instruction. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a second. But this is just one example of how CORE is using their data system, not as a way to you know, say this school's good or this school's bad in terms of SEL. That's dangerous, and, and I'll say in a second why we don't think that that would be appropriate. But they're using it to be guided by district level input from a variety of stakeholders, and they're, they're backing up what research tells us that enhancing social emotional skills can contribute to better academic outcomes. That's one point. The next point that I want to make is that these measures are really, really new, okay? And we still don't know yet whether or not, for example, some of the questions that are asked kids are fair. We don't know that yet. We are, we are still pulling apart the data to better understand, are these questions culturally biased? And what is the best use of this data? We don't know. It's still very new. But just giving you one example of how it can be used to help address issues of equity, and that's what CORE is doing. One other, very quickly, just one slide here of another example of SEL measurement in practice. Um, Washoe County School District in Nevada is taking some really innovative steps to incorporate SEL measurement across their district. They've developed their own survey, so just like CORE, they've got surveys measuring these kinds of skills in students. And the competencies that they've selected include self-awareness, responsible decision-making. Also, they also ask questions about social, um, I'm sorry, self-management. And what they do is a little bit different. They analyze this data as part of their early warning indicator system, which essentially identifies students that are at risk of dropping out based on grades, attendance, and, and suspensions. And I know this heart chart is really hard to read, but just each one of these bars relates to a different category that students are in terms of risk of dropping out. And one thing that has emerged from this is well, actually a couple of things. All students, no matter the category, are actually had pretty, they were rating themselves pretty low in terms of self-management. But also, students that were at high risk of dropping out, so the red bar, had the lowest. And so there might be a correlation here between students with like lower self-management scores and a high risk of dropping out. We don't know for sure, but that's what Washoe County is trying to use the data to better understand. And I should also say they're doing some really cool work around creating these data summits where they share the, da the data with the students and teachers have these collaborative conversations with students. And one thing that emerged from this is teachers weren't teaching about self-management or students didn't feel that teachers were teaching about self-management well enough. And this actually changed some practice in the district. So it's just one way. We don't work formally with Washoe County, but they're doing some really cool stuff and I wanted to point it out. Okay, so I've talked about surveys. Just one slide here. What else does this look like? Have any of you heard of the marshmallow test? Like this test where you basically, these Stanford researchers put a marshmallow out on a table and they, were, they tested with a kid and they said to the kids, you know, like, you have, you have an option. You can take this marshmallow or you can wait three minutes and I'll give you two. And it was this performance-based assessment from the 60s to essentially measure self-control, right? That's an example of, of, um, of like game-based or, or performance-based measurement. What we're doing, we're partnering with uh, the, set of the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL, Harvard, the RAND Corporation to better understand what other kinds of assessments are out there. Districts are in, di in different classrooms are doing all kinds of different assessments across the country. We're trying to get a survey to better understand what those are. Okay. 
including both surveys or those kinds of, of performance-based me measures. But I do want to give you one example of a game-based measure that it seems to be pretty promising. It's called CellWeb. Okay? And CellWeb is a game-based measure. It was developed by Clark McCown. He's a researcher to assess students' SEL from kindergarten through the third grade. And what it does is it measures competencies such as social awareness or the ability to take others' perspectives, the ability to solve social problem and as well uh, social problems as well as self-control. And it's done through a series of challenging and engaging online tasks. And I mention this just because they've done a couple of field trials with this. They've done some testing of it, and they found it was with over 4,400 students in six different states, and there were really some encouraging results. Okay. Um, students that scored higher on this program, were, those scores were positively correlated with teacher reports of, of ac both, both behavior and academic um, performance. So that's just, you know, very, very new. Basically what we're saying here is that students that are doing well on this kind of game-based performance also tend to do well academically, at least just in terms of this one thing in a, few, in a couple of field tests. Again, still very new. We're still checking it out. Okay, I just want to talk briefly about ESSA and how ESSA connects to SEL, and then I'll go through one final example. So by now, I know you've all heard of the Every Student Succeeds Act, passed at the end of 2015, uh, takes the place of No Child Left Behind, okay? And it devolves more power to states and to local authorities, providing them with a lot of flexibility to, as the core districts kind of did, although they needed a waiver at the time to do it, to expand the definition of student and school success. Throughout the law, there is a heavy emphasis placed on evidence-based approaches. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that's important in a second. And ESSA establishes an opportunity to incorporate SEL measures throughout state systems and local systems too, either for accountability purposes, for formative purposes, for, or for other kinds of data reporting. Okay? Just laying out there how this connects to SEL and SEL measures. So what does this mean? What are the specifics? How does ESSA actually support a data-informed approach to SEL? Well, one is SEL can be informal accountability. How many of you guys think that states are deciding to do that? None, right? Not yet. Okay, because there's still tons of questions about whether these measures are valid in a high-stakes setting whether they're reliable, there's different kinds of bias, and we as an organization do not think that a school should be rated or you know, uh, categorized based on uh, SEL measures alone, at least not yet, We're, the, the field's too new for it. But there's other ways. And one is you can integrate SEL into school needs assessment. So an example of this is Oregon. They have revamped their comprehensive needs assessment, which all schools have to engage in to figure out what are their strengths, what are some things that they want to work on, and it includes a uh, review of SEL practices. Another way, a little less formal, but a state can provide guidance to districts on evidence-based approaches. And what's an example of that? We have my home state, Massachusetts, um, has published and is coming out with guidelines on implementing SEL. What is this? It's not a, not a requirement, not making it mandatory to districts, but essentially gives some information about the research, what are some different professional learning opportunities. If you wanted to go about measuring this in your district, what are some things you might want to consider? What are some organizations you might want to work with? Okay? That's, this is all within, I got this all from going into, or we went, got this from going into different ESSA plans to figure out what they were doing. Another one is that if you have existing assessments, right, you can maybe tailor them to include SEL measures. What do I mean by that? Well, we're not seeing states do this a lot yet, not necessarily statewide, but we recommend it as a, at least in terms of piloting it. Okay, maybe taking some SEL measures and including them within culture and climate surveys. Right, so culture and climate surveys. We know a lot of states are doing this. We know districts have been doing this for a while. You're asking students, where are they in terms of, do they feel safe? Do they feel healthy in their school environment? There's actually some very interesting overlaps in the questions that are asked with SEL measures and culture and climate surveys, okay? And there's an opportunity there to, to tailor those, those assessments to include SEL. Sorry for the slightly uh, smaller font there, but uh, ESSA does provide some funding that can be used for SEL initiatives. Some of you may have heard of Title IV, basically this big block grant that's being distributed to states on a formula basis. 
It's really a way to fund a whole host of non-academic programming. Some states are deciding to do use this competitively, okay, which means that they're actually saying to districts, you've got to apply and we're going to fund what we think are the best things. Nevada has said that they may use some of this funding to prioritize SEL initiatives. So that's just one way that ESSA can be used as a vehicle to kind of incentivize the use of SEL programming and SEL measurement. And then lastly, okay, ESSA supports the use of formative SEL measurements. What does that mean? Just give you one quick example. Riverdale Regional School District in New Jersey, this is a district that we're working with now. And they're providing district-wide professional learning to develop expertise in something called data-informed learning cycles. These are also called PDSA cycles. It's a form of formative assessment that I'm going to talk about in a second. Okay? And that really goes with what S is trying to say, different kinds of innovative assessments being used at a local level. Okay. So let me just give this, this example here of district-wide formative assessment in action. So formative assessment, as I, I'm sure you, you guys know, it, it's a way to kind of gauge whether or not your practices are working in real time. Okay, and we think this is actually a very promising way to use SEL data. One form of formative assessment is called a learning cycle, as I just mentioned, or a PDSA cycle, and it's based in something called improvement science. And this is really just a process whereby, at least in the context of SEL, we ask ourselves, where do we want to better integrate SEL into our work? What kinds of professional opportunities should I focus on if I want to do that? What's a small change that I could make you know, over a, period of, a short period of time? And then this is the data piece, right? Like how will I know that making this small change actually will do anything, right? How do I know if it's working? So let's just walk through a quick example here of SEL formative assessment in action. So Ethan is a sixth grade teacher, okay? He thinks back to last year and fondly remembers his class's end of the year group science project. Parents loved it, students thought it was really engaging. For a full week, students worked in groups to find a unique solution to a pressing environmental problem. At the end of the week, students presented their solutions in an event for parents, students, and community members. Because this project entails research, planning, collaboration, lots of time management, a lot of self-management for kids, Ethan reflects on the fact that this activity, more than anything else that he does during the year, appears to be a great opportunity for developing students' self-management skills. Okay. But that said, okay, he believes there are ways to better and more intentionally develop students' self-management skills and really wants to hone these parts of the activity this coming year. Okay? So what he does is he tests an idea, okay? Maybe he goes off and he does some professional learning or he talks to some other folks in his school. Maybe he, he works with, uh, gets some, some good strategies online. And he decides that one self-management strategy that he wants to try is to intentionally build students' awareness of how they learn best. It's just one strategy, a small change that he's making to this science project. So at the beginning of the project, he's gonna invite each student to create a list of statements by completing the phrase, I focus slash learn best when. This is just a, a self-management skill uh, a strategy. So I focus best when. And then he'll facilitate a discussion in which students share a few ideas of how they learn best. Okay, so that's either talking aloud with a partner, validating a theory by reading text, and also discuss a few things they might want to try to avoid, like reading before bed trying to start a project without understanding directions. Right? And then finally, he'll have students record how often these situations occur and track their progress over time. And he'll have weekly check-ins with them. So this is just an example of formative assessment in action, right, in the context of SEL. We go back to our chart here. We see that what Ethan did is he found, he's like, yeah, you know, I want to better integrate SEL into my work. Okay, he wants to do it through this project. That's the professional opportunity that he wants to focus on. He found a small change he wanted to make, which is just incorporating some self-management strategies, skill, skill building. And then he's gonna have students track how they're doing, and he's gonna talk to them and have these weekly conferences and figure out whether it's working, okay? So how does this actually relate to ESSA, right? How does ESSA support the use of this formative assessment? Well, 
It does provide some funding sources, right? So Title I is one, one way that can be used to, to fund professional learning, okay? Title IV, like I just mentioned. This isn't a lot of money, folks. This is not tons and tons of money, but it's just one way that ESSA can be used to support this kind of work. ESSA also encourages and in some case require, in cases requires these evidence-based approaches. So the evidence-based approach that I'm talking about here is this, this process of inquiry, this, this improvement science. It's been endorsed by the Carnegie Foundation. Um, I talked about CORE before and taking apart that, that data and better understanding it. They've partnered with a, a policy analysis for California education. They have a research partnership. They endorse the use of improvement science. That's all you really need to do. S is not actually terribly specific on this. And then more broadly, ESSA encourages innovation, right? So as leaders, as you all, right, are thinking your, rethinking your systems and you're thinking about what are some different kinds of assessments you might want to include, ESSA kind of incentivizes you to think about, well, maybe you'll include informative assessment. That's just one way, right? So um, with that, I've got some questions I'd like to ask you, but I want to open it up. I know I've given you a lot here. Do any of you have questions about any of this, whether it relates to what SEL is, why measurement is so important? You can ask me some questions about what, like a couple of the examples I gave you in practice, how it relates to ESSA, anything of the nature. Mm. Great question. Um, so I would say this, when it comes to surveys, understandably, we don't have a very good understanding of that, right? Um, I mean, you can think about like a first grader trying to answer this. And the work that we do, we actually started from grade four and up. That's where we found a lot of that, where the, the, the scores have been valid and reliable. However, this is a great, I love this question because we think that there's an opportunity to start working with some of these game-based or performance-based assessments, right? CellWeb specifically was created to start measuring this in kindergartners through third graders for this very reason, okay? So one of the things that you want, I was just in this great presentation uh, it just before um, where we were talking about assessment literacy. It really comes down to like what you think you're gonna use the data for. Right? If what you really want to do is try to capture student voice, that's really, really hard with kindergartners through third graders. However, it's much easier to do that with older students. If that's one of the core things you want to do, surveys are excellent for that. Right? However, there are some questions about validity and reliability, especially in, in higher, higher stakes settings that maybe make you think, I don't know if surveys are the best idea, maybe game-based. Uh, performance measures could be good. And actually, this works better for, for younger students as well. Okay. Great question. Anything else? Yeah. Where would I go online to see the survey questions? Absolutely. So if you go to our website, transformingeducation.org, and then you go to, we have our resources tab. And if you go down to educator resources, there is a paper called Measuring Mesh. So measuring, and then the acronym MESH. And what that does, sir, is that that's all of our curated questions available free. Um, uh, it gives a little bit of background with the research, and then it provides those items at the end. You can use those scales. Now, obviously, those are not the only ones you could use. There's a lot of other uh, material out there. I will say they've been curated by researchers, so I, I, you know, it's free also. I recommend you, you take a look at that first, but, but there are other measures out there too. Anything else? I have a couple of questions I want to ask you, but I, I want to make myself available to it. So I think a big question around SEL is this, this issue of use, right? Like what are you, not just whether you're asking kids these questions, but like what are you gonna do with it? I, what do you think or how do you think SEL data, based at least just on this presentation, but any of your, over, uh, any of your other thoughts, how do you think it might or should be used in schools? 
we are constantly trying to understand what people think about this because there's a wide variety of questions. Uh, for us, being a, we're in the airspace community, we see a lot of the social-emotional skills not there. Maybe um, if those students are identified as missing similar skills, create a class especially for that. Yep. Build, build those skills. Yep. Okay, great. So like maybe using the data to create a specific academic part of the academic curriculum, right? That's that's great. And I think a lot of times we see, you know, people putting this off on the side, but like one thing we're noticing that schools really want to try to do is integrate it within the work they're already doing or even having like a separate class for it as well. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Great kind of targeting resources as well to that. Yes, one other. So do you have a vision of how SEL should be implemented in your system, your school, your state, and what do you think you'd like to see your district, your school, your state, or even uh, Congress or, or, or the US Department of Education do to support that vision? It's another way of asking, you know, when you came to this session today, what are you kind of seeing as your vision for using SEL? And what do you think are the roadblocks, or what are the things that might make it easier to implement that vision, to support that? We started this year in my, in my school, yep. and we saw the need that there were a lot of kids coming to us without these skills in yep. place. And so what we've been trying to do this year is explicitly teach this. And so we blocked off a section during our week where we're teaching the skills. And um, that's just what we're looking at is seeing how it's going to impact our academics when these skills come in place. Because we can't just, kids don't just come with these skills to school, a lot right. of them. And assuming that they have them is getting us into a lot of trouble. Right. So uh, that's kind of where we are with it is we're just put our foot in the water, but trying to figure out what's working. We've adopted the Mind Up curriculum. Mind Up, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so time will tell. Yep. But so far my teachers love it. And yep. the kids are enjoying the lessons too. And so, is, so that's great. So you've identified the need for these, uh, to build these skills. You, you've very thoughtfully embedded it within the work that you're already doing. Um, is, so is there a way that you feel that that could be better supported by not just the state, but what, what do you think could happen that, that, that some people say, you know, it'd be better supported if I had like, you know, more buy-in from like parents or community members too. Not that they're against it, but they're not as informed about the fact that this can take place in school. I'm just curious what you think could be used to support your work. And I feel like that's kind of up to us at our school level right now is yep. to communicate out with our community stakeholders. Absolutely. We've got a luncheon plan to communicate with them as well as a parent night. But as we're trying to figure this out, bringing them along with us, yep. asking them what they feel like, what skills they feel like their kids need coming to school. Absolutely. The problem is, is that a lot of times the parents are really need to have that voice about what skills you know, the kids who are lacking in those skills are the parents that are sometimes hardest to get into school yep. for those meetings. And yep. So that makes it challenging too. So. So, so that's actually a great point. When core decided that they wanted to prioritize a few different competencies. They did a really good job of reaching out to communities and saying, what are some skills that you want to see in your students, mm -hmm. in your kids, right? And, and that actually worked to feed the decision making there. And that's actually, a, a, I didn't put it on our policy recommendation list there, but a huge thing that we say as an organization is that before, from the very beginning, is if you decide to do this in your state or in your district or in your school, You've got to try to connect with your community to figure out, you know, it, it's a couple of things. One, it goes back to that Tower of Babel issue. There's a lot of different language floating around about this, and keeping parents, like, informed about how you're defining it is really important. Mm -hmm. And then also just figure out, look, there's a lot of different competencies out there. You can't focus on, like, 19 of them. What are some things that parents might think are important? So I think that's a really good point. And yes, I hear your point also about, like, it's hard to get all parents participating in that conversation. But the effort is really important, yes. In Arkansas, the commissioner has his goal number three, the development of personal competencies. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're really, really rolling this into that. And 
Uh, we're developing that. We have a lot of new tools and a website that's going to be launched. We're in that development stage this year to bring more information out to our state and have more resources available. Absolutely. We also sent out a survey the last two weeks of school. Mm -hmm. uh, not just timing-wise, it came out very late, not expecting a great turnout. In the last two weeks, we had almost 2,000 respondents. Wow. And it showed that uh, people believe the importance is an 8 out of 1 out of 10. Mm -hmm. And yet the application and development in their current schools and their settings and their charter programs is a 2. Mm. Interesting. So they, they recognize the importance, but they don't have the tools to get there. Yeah. So that's what, I mean, we are on fire and developing and working with counselors, teachers, administrators yeah. across the state, other associations, groups. Great. We'll probably be looking more at the mesh and everything. Yep. Research, so we're yeah, and I think what you said is, I mean, another concrete example, I think everything you're, you're talking about there really resonates. Um, in Massachusetts, a group of five different uh, education associations, so uh, I think it was the superintendents, um, school principals, I think school counselors, the ed collaboratives, these professional organizations got together and created this network is collaborative and it's kind of supported by the state ed department not formally but they're part of the conversations and what and we, we we partnered with them and a couple of other organizations to help lead this effort and we put out an application to districts saying you know we would like to pilot some of this work with three or four different districts thinking maybe we'd get eight districts that you know just the law of halves right you get half that that apply and we'll do it with three or four we had 36 and we actually had to like make it now eight to ten different districts that are part of this network. And I think that relates to your point, Lori, that there's a lot of interest in this. There's a lot of energy behind it. But connecting that to like resources and information is a big step, right? And I, I, I like to think our organization helps with that. But I, I think just in general, there's the SEA, the state can has a vital role. And just going through all these ESSA plans and talking to state leaders um, like, like yourselves, I, I, you can see that there's a real concerted push to make this more of a priority. So I've got just one minute left here, but I'd be happy to take any other questions on this work at all. Anything else about it? OK. Well, I'll leave you with this. Um, we put out a weekly newsletter, OK? To the best of my knowledge, and I could be totally wrong about this, it is the only national loot weekly newsletter on social emotional learning in K through 12 schools. Um, please go in and sign up for it, it's easy. We won't fill up your inbox with a bunch of other stuff, I promise, okay? And you can get that by going to our website. You can also get free toolkits, all right? They, they focus on a number of these competencies. We also have another one that we just put out on mindfulness, which has been really popular, I think. Um, please follow us on Twitter, okay? We try to always share when there's other SEL events nationally, conferences, different kinds of webinars, things like that. We do that both in our newsletter and online the Twitter. And then if you have any questions, any comments, any feedback about this, I think SEL measurement is something that, you know, it's, it's a new thing. I said that many times, and I'd be happy to try to answer your question or connect you to somebody in our research department um, that does. I'll be around for the next few minutes. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciated your attention and everything. Good luck. <laughs>